when it comes to aircraft used in World War I, it is very tempting to talk about scout fighters. I have been guilty of this myself. It is these that attract the apparent glamour associated with air combat, uh, knights of the air and all that. Of course, there is no actual glamour to aerial combat. It is all grim brutality. Life for the pilots was nasty, brutish and short. However, for the purposes of propaganda, countries on all sides of the conflict elected to glamorize successful scout fighter pilots, the so-called aces. What is very easy to overlook is that early military aviation was focused on reconnaissance and bombing. In fact, the very first wartime combat missions undertaken by aircraft were recon flown during the Italo-Turkish War of 1911-1912. to This conflict also saw the very first bombing missions flown by aircraft, both heavier than air and lighter than air. Early bombing missions generally used non-specialized aircraft, and the means of delivering the payload was no more sophisticated than tossing it over the side and hoping to miss the wings. Uh, Sotto tenente Giulio Gavotti's account of the first bombing mission pays tribute to this, you can find it in my presentation on the Etrich Tauber, uh, the world's first bomber aircraft, linked below. In light of the Italians' experience in Libya, perhaps it is not surprising that the search for more sophisticated means of killing an enemy began to be developed. Early among these efforts were heavy bombers, pioneered before World War I by the Russians and the Italians. And it is the Italian effort that is the subject of this presentation the Caproni CA-1 and its immediate successors. I should probably apologize in advance for my Italian pronunciation to stave off remarks in the comments. By the outbreak of World War I, Caproni, also known as Societa di Agostini e Caproni, was already a significant factor in early Italian aviation. Uh, founded in 1908 by Giovanni Battista Caproni, uh, pictured on the left with his brother Federico, the firm initially produced a series of small single-engined aircraft, including the Caproni CA-1, CA-6, and CA-12. Uh, now, just to make that clear, that's not the CA-1 we're discussing. That's a different CA-1, known as the CA-1 of 1910 for clarification. On a curious side note, Giovanni Caproni was born on July 3rd, 1886, in Messone d'Arco, which at the time was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It didn't become part of Italy until 1919. The significance of this is that Italy was fighting the Austro-Hungarian Empire from May 23, 1915 until the end of World War I, and I have not been able to determine if he acquired Italian citizenship before 1919. Caproni's early aircraft had been quite small. The CA-1 of 1910 was a relatively conventional wooden fabric biplane of a box kite configuration. The undercarriage consisted of a dual main wheel and skid arrangement, with outrigger wheels at each wingtip and a tail wheel. Perhaps the most notable design feature was the single engine driving two puller propellers, although this is not without precedent. The follow-on CA-6 of 1911 was unusual for its lack of a fuselage, but other aspects of it were more conventional, with a wheel and skid undercarriage and a single propeller. After this, Caproni switched to monoplanes, which were also conventional in design and quite successful, although all of them can be considered experimental. Uh, they were used for demonstration flights and as trainers at Caproni's flying school at the Caschina Malpensa, today's Milan Malpensa airport. Uh, none went into serial production. The genesis of a heavy bomber probably came about through his association with Julio Doe, a military strategist. As a result of the Italo-Turkish War, he wrote a report on the aviation lessons learned during the conflict, in which he suggested that high-altitude bombing should be the primary role of aircraft. Presumably putting theory into practice, Caproni began the design of what would become the Caproni CA-1 heavy bomber in mid-1913. This is an inauspicious, yet fortuitous time for Caproni as he was forced to liquidate his firm, 
but Due suggested that the Italian War Ministry purchase the company's assets and turn them into the Aviation Battalion's maintenance depot and experimental workshop. Due's suggestion had significant clout, as he was at the time the commanding officer of the Aviation Battalion in Turin. Preliminary design work for a large three-engine bomber was completed in late 1913, and on the 27th of January 1914, Douay applied to the War Ministry to fund the Gnome rotary engine prototype. This precipitated a bitter struggle between those who favoured airships and supporters of aircraft. This proved a drawn-out process and included organising a committee of industrialists prepared to undertake production and the leaking of flight test results to the press. The controversy cost Douay his command and he was exiled to the infantry, but regardless an order for 12 aircraft was placed with committee member Arturo Mercanti on 29th of December 1914. Now, Mercanti didn't actually have a factory, so the War Ministry loaned him the prototype and the aircraft battalion's maintenance depot and experimental workshop that they had acquired from Caproni, along with the entire non-military workforce. So it has to be said that Caproni came out of this rather well. Engines were a problem. Uh, despite the early known power plants, the Italian army wanted the aircraft to use 100 horsepower Fiat A10s, reverse engineered from the Mercedes D1 inline, uh, but Fiat proved unable to meet its commitments. This contributed to Caproni falling behind schedule on deliveries and caused more friction with the army. The first aircraft, designated the CA-1, wasn't delivered until the 23rd of July 1915 to the Sezioni Biplani Caproni, based out of La Cumina. The unit flew its first combat mission with the new bomber on the 20th of August 1915, when it attacked the Austrian airfield at Isavisa. The Caproni CA-1 of 1914 was in some ways conventional, despite its large size, and weighing in at just over 7,200 pounds empty, it was a large aircraft. Uh, fully laden, it was 8,800 pounds. The wings, though um, large, with a 74-foot span, were of a well-established design, twin spar, three-bay, wire-braced, and constant cord. The tailplane rudders and elevator were composed of welded steel tubes covered in fabric. Uh, the wooden truss tail booms are reminiscent of Blériot's. The nacelle, to my eyes at least, is rather reminiscent of the voisins, as is the undercarriage, though voisin bombers used a four-wheeled uh, perambulator design, whereas Caproni's is a three-wheeled shopping trolley. Also, very like the voisins, there is a tail skid. The front wheel wasn't technically part of the landing system, but was present to protect the nose of the aircraft from bumps and bounces. On the ground, the aircraft would rest on the tail skid, leaving the front wheel raised, rather amusingly, in mid-air. This too followed voisin practice, although those later dispensed with the skid. Where the Caproni CA-1 becomes unconventional is that it was a three-engined design, with two propellers mounted in the wings pulling, and a third behind the nacelle pushing. Where Caproni got this idea from is not known, but I'm speculating that he needed as much power as possible, and with early engines his best method of doing so was multiple engines, which made necessary multiple propellers. The three-crew nacelle had the gunner positioned right up front for the 6.5mm Fiat Rivelli Modello 1914 machine gun, and the two pilots, with full dual controls and a central engine control panel, behind him. It has to be said that the Fiat Rivelli probably wasn't the best machine gun for aerial use, with its positively bizarre 50 or 100 round clip-feed box magazine. Uh, but it remained the standard machine gun of the Italian army throughout World War I and into World War II, despite being somewhat prone to malfunctions due to the over-complexity of the feed system, especially the 100-round magazines, and being slow to reload. A bomb load was up to 2,200 pounds, or 1,000 kilograms, 
though missions requiring extra range would reduce this. Performance was less than stellar, but not untypical of early World War I bombers. With a top speed of 75 miles per hour, a surface ceiling of just over 13,000 feet, and a range of just under 350 miles, it might best be described as an underpowered, lumbering, vulnerable beast in the air, and fell far short of the high-altitude bomber envisaged by Julio Due. However, it was of a sturdy construction, and turned out to be well-suited for the installation of new engines. Engines were something of a problem during early construction, and some production was undertaken by Robert Esno Pelteres, REP factory. Uh, precise numbers are difficult to nail down, but 14 were built in 1915, and possibly as many as 41 in 1916. While some were certainly technically CA1s, the experimentation makes it difficult to assign a definitive type. Early attempts to use Lorraine Dietrich AMs proved unsatisfactory, and the wing power plants were replaced with 80 horsepower the own 9C or 9J rotaries. The pusher engine was replaced with a 130 horsepower Salmson. This combination left the CA1 still underpowered, but may have pointed the way towards the CA2 and went into production. It appears these aircraft were not actually used by the French, but delivered to the Italians. A total production of the CA1 was just over 160 units. Back in Italy, as an initial modification, the Fiat A10 pusher engine behind the nacelle was replaced with a more powerful 150 horsepower Isotta Frascini VB4, which seems to have been tweaked to 190 horsepower later in the war. Combat operations in 1915 and early 1916 showed the vulnerability of the aircraft from the rear and so a second gunner's position was installed to the rear of the nacelle, in a cage above the pusher engine. This cannot have been particularly comfortable for the gunner, with the roaring engine below him and whirling propeller in front of him, but this would have provided some added protection from aircraft attacking from behind. Armament was another Fiat Revelli. Designated the CA-2, Performance improved somewhat with a top speed of 83 miles per hour. Still rather leisurely, uh, nonetheless at least it had an extra gunner. A very few were actually manufactured, perhaps nine. Most likely because the next obvious step, of course, was to replace the Fiat A10 engines powering the propellers mounted in the wings, and this was done in 1916, once again using the 150 horsepower Isotta Frascini VB4. This resulted in the definitive CA-3, the most produced variant. Of these, some 290 were manufactured by Caproni during the war, and 30 or so by the French, although numbers and engine types of the latter are uncertain. Worth noting is that nearly 200 more were manufactured between 1919 and 1925, as the CA-3 was considered sturdier and more reliable than the later CA-5, which is not going to be the subject of this video. Still basically an up-engined CA-1, the CA-3 could only manage 85 miles per hour, but this was faster than the contemporary Voisin bombers with a substantially increased bomb load. The CA-3 was still capable of lifting over 2,000 pounds of bombs into the air, so by the standards of 1916, I think it's safe to regard the Caproni CA-3 as a thoroughly respectable bomber. Squadriglia, that is, squadrons, were formed around the heavy bombers as they rolled off the production lines. By May of 1916, there were nine, and by the end of the war, there were 15 operational. Most of these operated out of the San Pelagio airfield near Padua, in addition to training schools and smaller flights. The 12th Quadriglia was transferred to Libya, becoming operational in October of 1916. There it operated against German U-boats in the Mediterranean, and actually remained in Libya throughout World War II, although obviously not still flying Capronis. 
From February 1918, the 5th, 14th and 15th Squadriglia operated out of Villeneuve-les-Vertus in northern France until the armistice. The CA-3 continued in service until at least 1927. Some were converted to six-passenger airliners. For an aircraft that first saw flight in 1914, this is a remarkable achievement. There are two known surviving original CA-3s. One is at the Italian Air Force Museum in Bracciano, Lazio. The other is in the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio.